calyces like this, and you really finish the case very fast, especially with these new lithotriptors now, with the trilogy and with the, with the other one from Olympus, it's unbelievable how fast these procedures can be. So all this, I will not tire you with all the research that we have done because you can find it, you can find it on, the, on PubMed, you can find everything. This is the latest study that we did. It was a prospective randomized study that we did papillary and non-papillary puncture. We saw no, absolutely no difference in hemoglobin loss. And, and the amazing concept also is the speed of how you do this and the speed reflects on reducing radiation exposure. This is a study that is being under publication right now. The, 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 the radiation time goes down tremendously with this easiness of puncture. So something to keep in mind for people that are criticizing. So I would say that the question clearly as to whether this is safe or not goes towards yes, no doubt. And you know, I would say that if it wouldn't be safe, I would be in jail now. And you know, I always like to take the Twitters and show what the rest of the world is doing. So some people were asking me, can you do it supine? Of course I can do it supine. Guido, Justy, everyone knows it. He did a couple of cases, no bleeding. And there's other people that did it and found no difference also. But it goes on, it goes on. Some people do it accidentally. They want to go through the papilla and they cannot manage to go, especially if the calyx is impacted. So they go a bit here and a bit there and they manage to go in and put the wire down the gyrode and do, do the case. So they were really, they are surprised because they don't have bleeding and they say, well, it probably is the chance I was lucky. But do you go back to what the interventional radiologists are doing when they're doing nephrostomies or when the urologists are doing nephrostomies for dilated systems just to uh, deviate the urine and drain the urine? Do you think they go through papillas? No way. They always go through anywhere into the dilated pelvis and puncture and, and, and do their job. So, and you know, some need to see it to believe it. Clearly, how do you see it to believe it? We have been trying to teach and show what we're doing to everyone. I, I, I remember my discussion with Brian Eisner many years ago on a Starbucks coffee. I was explaining to him how we do it. Other people come to us, they come to our center and they see us doing it. And when they come to our center, I see in their eyes the surprise when they don't see blood coming out from everywhere because they would expect blood flowing around and that we would, we would be next to the biggest blood, blood unit of of the Mediterranean, uh, but that doesn't happen. And you know, it's, it's a topic that has generated great discussion on Twitter and on the social network. And this is a big success because discussion always brings advancement. And you know, instead of doing a, of having a conclusion, uh, you, you, probably, you probably will see that everyone needs to do it to be convinced. And there are certain rules that PCNL clearly bleeding does not follow rules because if it would be, if that avascular plane of Brodel really existed, then the anatrophic nephrolithotomies would have been bloodless, but that doesn't exist. And then we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have any bleeding rates. So this, this is the only bloodless PCNL that you can actually find. If you can find this, this is really the way to go. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lazakis. Uh, very nice presentation. Uh, so uh, now we'll uh, move uh, to Dr. Tarek Zahrani, your opponent, uh, defending uh, papillary puncture. Uh, and we'll have discussion afterwards. Uh, okay, Tarek, can you share your screen, please? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Uh, before we start, we start, Tarek, we just want to launch a poll. If everybody can see it, please, and answer the question. Do I answer also, Wisham? No, of course, we know you're answering. <laughs> uh, Dr. Tarek, can you unmute yourself? Yeah, uh, hello? Yes. Okay, we'll just give him 30 seconds more to answer the poll, and then we'll start with your presentation. Where can I see this? Uh, this? Can you see it or not? 
don't see it. I don't know where it is. It pops up. It pops up on your main screen. Yeah, as a co-host, he cannot answer. Yeah, yeah, but can you see it? No, no, no I, I cannot see it. Because, probably because he shared the screen. That's right. why. So okay. So the question was: Have you performed non-papillary PSNM? Uh, Forty-three percent answered never, and twenty-five percent only in special situations, and thirty-two percent I did it non-intentionally. But with some, if you add the two second categories, most of the people have done non-papillary punctures. It's unbelievable, eh? Yes. It means that fifty-seven percent of the people have done non-papillary punctures. It's yeah, exactly. Yeah, either for specific, uh, special situation. Or oh, non-intentional. They have done it, though. They have yeah. done it. Unbelievable. It's nice. Nice to see. Okay. Nice Tarek, see. can you start? Okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, so I'll be talking about uh, how do I how do I go through. It doesn't move my slides. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the, definitely everyone who does the PCNL thinks what's the best uh, puncture. And I like this definition. It's the puncture that allows you to access the stone and complete your stone clearance without injury to the surrounding structures or uh, without having a bleeding. Now, in the literature, as uh, Dr. Evangelis mentioned, that uh, the, the uh, rule is to go through the uh, renal calyx and not through the infundibulum or the pelvis. So you can go here and here, but not here. Uh, and that has been challenged by our colleagues in Greece when they published their uh, study in 2016, uh, give, mentioning their experience with the uh, non-papillary uh, puncture. They, I'm not going to go through a lot of the studies, and, and uh, Dr. Evangelis showed us uh, lovely uh, live uh, images of the technique. Uh, and uh, they, they had 137 uh, cases in the first uh, study, most of them were single stones, and I was just, just discussing with Dr. Evangelis uh, about this, but uh, cut off and uh, started the meeting before we uh, we can finish our discussion. And I noticed that most of these stones are single stones, and and uh, our colleagues in the next session after us might argue that this could be managed by a mini PCNL or by a URS or something like that. But this is the diversity of the stones that they had in their studies. In some centers around the world, PCNL is much easier and much cheaper than URS, and that's the, the, the way they go. And when you're experienced, you do what you feel comfortable with most. Now, again, coming to those uh, numbers, their technique involves using a 30 French uh, uh, axis. So they don't, don't use a smaller one, they use the normal uh, nephroscopy in 30 French. And uh, what I understood is that they put a malicot at the end. Now, I do a, I do a tubeless uh, PCNL most of the time, and I don't know if the malicot itself uh, would be the tampon at the bleeding, because according to the uh, guidelines uh, of the AUA and the Urology Society that uh, uh, you can do a tubeless and uh, you can put a nephrostomy tube when you have bleeding or injury uh, or residual stones. So I would love to hear Dr. Uh, Evangelis's answer at this at the end. Now coming to the outcome, they had a similar hospital, uh, hospital state loss, a few cases required um, required uh, some ancillary uh, procedures uh, um, for those stones. And the complication, the overall complication rate, although 10%, now most of them are not, you know, uh, severe. The hemorrhage itself was about 3% uh, percent, uh, their, their uh, series. And uh, they had a lovely conclusion from that study. It, uh, the, it kind of moved the Indurology Society, that paper. So they went uh, ahead and did the randomized uh, paper. And they looked at 55 cases of papillary of, and non-papillary. And their main goal was to look at the hemoglobin drop and need for transfusion. Uh, they excluded a few abnormalities in the uh, kidneys. The procedure, again, 30 French. Uh, a sheet and a malicot re-entry at the end of the uh, procedure. And again, the stone size probably was towards the smaller uh, size. Most of the stones were less than two uh, 
centimeters uh, uh, in size. And the bleeding uh, was the same. The hemoglobin loss was the same in both arms, which is the main thing they were looking at. And the, the, the hospital stay was a little bit longer than the previous publication, but again, uh, probably around three to seven uh, days, depending on the patients. And they didn't have much of um, complications. A few patients, the, one had a, a pseudoaneurysm uh, from the papillary group, and one had a, a, a hematuria that resolved spontaneously from the infundibular uh, group. Now, uh, their conclusion again, which Dr. Evangelis already uh, mentioned. Now, coming to what's against. So if, if, this, is, if this is their numbers, why, why, why shouldn't we all do non-papillary uh, punctures? Again, this is, this is the uh, study from uh, Sampaio showing the anatomy. And I really believe that surgery is anatomy and that we have to respect the anatomy of the, uh, the kidney. In that study, they showed that their uh, this is, this is, by the way, a review by Margaret Pearl. She mentioned, uh, she, she did a, a, a small uh, review uh, in the current opinion. And uh, in this study, they mentioned that if you puncture the, the uh, infundibulum of the upper pole, you get about 26% of uh, bleeding, 23% if it's in the mid pole, 13% if in the lower pole. While if you puncture the calyx, you will have no arterial bleeding and probably 8% of venous bleeding. Now, a lot of, a lot of people, including Margaret Pearl, uh, thought that this, these papers were underpowered. Probably the sample size calculation uh, was not enough to, uh, to, with, to come with this conclusion. They wondered about what's, what is the hemoglobin level that cut off that you used to calculate the uh, sample size, and I hope Dr. Evangelis will shed the um, uh, answer about this in a moment. And again, she mentioned something very, very nice here, that these results reflect the level of expertise of our, our, our colleagues in Greece more than uh, a generalizability and safety of the approach. They are experts. They do, as Dr. Wissam mentioned, uh, to me, they sometimes do nine PCNLs in one day, and that is extraordinary for anybody. Another group from uh, Italy, again, mentioned probably the same thing. They were thought, thinking about the sample size and, uh, and a few things. So I think that surgery is anatomy, that the best puncture, again, is the one that gives you the stone without injuring the surrounding uh, puncture. I would use the middle calyx probably as an accessory, as another puncture rather than a primary puncture for, uh, for, the, uh, for the stone. And, um, uh, and I, I still think that the non-papillary puncture still has a long journey to, to convince neurologists to, to use this puncture. Uh, thank you very much. And I personally, have a few questions. I'm sure I've done uh, a non-papillary uh, unintentionally, not intentionally. I wouldn't intentionally do a non-papillary, but but uh, uh, and and probably. But again, for those who do PCNLs, probably the only thing that might draw you from a PCNL to a URS is the fear of this bleeding. And um, I, I read the protocol of our colleagues. I've seen that. I do a tubeless procedure, by the way, so uh, I really feel about it. But again, I don't see much cases with bleeding. I had two patients who had a hemothorax. I had four patients who I required to, uh, to transfuse. But again, uh, I would like to, to go back to Dr. Evangelis and probably shed a little bit of light about the points that I've mentioned in my uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tariq. Uh, we'll move to Dr. Lapsakis again yeah. for his uh, comments regarding that. So I, I've I'm taken some notes. I will try to answer to most of the questions, to all of the questions, and then I'll also address some questions of the audience. First of all, stone size. Stone size, the reason you saw the small size stones there is that we try to standardize 
and put unif and minimize other factors like big uh, big stones would have inflammation whatever we we wanted to do what kind of trauma and injury we are doing to the kidney independent of the stone size so stone size is not something that should you should focus on we try to keep the stone size in the same in the same range so that's the reason that we we did this in our center we do we do you know stones for staghorns we do stones and now we're publishing papers on these kind of subcategories, but initially we wanted to keep one kind of category of stones, do a retrospective study, perspective, basic research on this. So we wanted to move toward that direction. Malekot at the end of the, uh, of the case. The Malekot does not tamponate. The Malekot, no tube is tamponating at the end. So the tamponate is not an effect that the tube is doing. The reason we use Malekot in some cases, and I will explain, uh, the variety afterwards is that some some of our patients come from far away. They come from places that they do not have access to urologists. So if we put a double J stent, they would have to go somewhere afterwards to take it out. By using a malacot, you keep in the patient for three days, but then you pull the malacot tail out, and the patient has nothing in. This is the reason we use the malacot. Now, one of the big differences that we have done in our practice the latest years is that we are doing a big study right now and we're trying to create a nomogram. For me, one of the biggest tools that I have doing PCNL is the ultrasonic probe. So anything that does not use an ultrasonic probe is delaying the case for me. But at the moment, we, have, we are using either the scope, the conventional scope, which is a 26 with a 30 French dilation, or the 18 French scope from, uh, from storage with a 20 or 22 dilator. How do we decide which, which, which one will be used? When we do the retrograde, we see the anatomy of the calluses. And if the anatomy of the pelvis and the calluses is small, we use a smaller scope. So this is the change that we have done. And at the moment, we are doing studies also to prove the non-papillary puncture with a smaller scope. Uh, now, Going to the papers that are criticizing us, clearly whatever is new is being criticized, but I will just tell you a couple of facts. The American literature right now, it's very interesting that the Americans are criticizing the non-papillary puncture, but they are going, most of them, 90% over the 12th rib and go get access to the upper calyx. So they, they get the risk of the pneumo, pneumo, pneumothorax, whatever, but they consider the fear of having bleeding which makes no sense. I repeat, if we would have bleeding with thousands of cases that we are doing in Patras, I would be probably transmit to this webinar from the jail of Patras around, uh, around here because I would have killed a couple of patients, okay, with the trans transfusions and everything. But it's, as I said, you need to see to be convinced. And for the people that come and see, at least they leave the department with a big question mark. Why is this guy not bleeding? And as to another rule that we have in the department, the, the department has the rule of standardization. So we standardize everything that we do. Panayotis, Kalidonis does exactly the same thing. Our fellow right now does exactly the same thing. So it's not a matter of teaching. It's not that I am the expert. And because the puncture itself, anyone does it. Anyone that comes and trains can do it afterwards. Expertise has to do with more difficult cases. So a one centimeter, 1.52 centimeter stones, which is real, in reality is the axis, this technique is very easy to teach. This is a big advantage of this puncture. You do not need to negotiate an impacted calyx with stone with a wire for half an hour, trying to puncture five or six times. Most of the times with one puncture, you're in. And this is a great advantage for the trainees. So standardization is very important. Now, as I said, if you go to live surgeries, and a lot of you have seen live surgeries, you realize that most of the surgeons try to start with a papillary puncture. If they are lucky, they do it, and they're very experienced surgeons. They puncture once, they cannot do it. Twice, they cannot do it. You have seen, and we have seen, all the experts of PCNL doing non-papillary punctures in life, all of them. And we are laughing, I'm laughing with them, but what will they do? They can't have access, so they go non-papillary. Do they have bleeding afterwards? No, they don't have bleeding. So to sum up, to sum up, I would say that it is not the papillary puncture or the non-papillary puncture itself that bleeds. 
You know what makes it bleed? The torquing of the scope. I might be more aggressive with the torquing of the scope afterwards because I want to reach all the calluses with one puncture, okay? This is what makes it bleed, not the puncture itself. Puncture itself does not make it bleed. And let me tell you, people puncture through the liver and through the spleen and it doesn't bleed, okay? Imagine, here you're going to the kidney, it doesn't bleed. And I repeat, there are two ways of putting drains afterwards. If you decide to put a nephrostomy and a double J stent, you send the patient home the next day. We do not do this. We balance what the patient needs are and when he's coming from. So if we do something that we want to have no tubes at the end, we put a malacot tail inside. I saw a comment in the questions when I started. There's more questions, but I saw a comment why bother doing a flexible, why bother doing a PCNL for a stone of 1.5 centimeters and not go with flexible and avoid complications? We are underestimating the complications of flexible ureteroscopy. Flexible ureteroscopy can kill the patient because we, we, it can create a sepsis. We are, we are going to discuss this point thoroughly in the next uh, session okay. because Good. there's a comparison between this. But uh, here. One, one, one comment, just please. Dr. Evangelis, uh, I, I know you have a lot of ongoing research and stuff. Uh, are you going to compare? Uh, do you do tubeless, by the way, or you don't do tubeless? Because I noticed in the study that all the patients had the malicot. So I will tell you, the study, the study was performed a couple of times. We, we progress and we do, you know, we changed. We, we have a, doing the nomogram right now. We are moving also to smaller scopes. We have done also 12 friends. So if we combine, for example, if I have a staggered calculus and I need to go to the upper pole with my second puncture, I will always lose the smaller pun the, the smaller dilation. Okay, so I, the reason I don't do tubeless is conceptual. Conceptually, I want to leave a tube inside the kidney for the first 24 hours. Why? If I have sepsis, okay, and I don't have a tube inside, and the patient comes with sepsis, then what do you do on your tubeless? Okay, so tubeless is only not for bleeding. The tube is left in place, not for the bleeding. The bleeding would tamponate itself anyway. The, the tube is left inside the kidney for security. Some people leave it for five hours. Some people leave it for the night. Some people leave. So I don't see the advantage that I would risk. What is the disadvantage and the morbidity of putting a tube in for a couple of hours, for 12 hours, 13 hours, with a double J stand and then pulling out the tube and the patient goes home? If I get sepsis, and believe me, there comes experience because I, we have seen a lot of cases. You will get a sepsis one day. And if you get a sepsis and you don't have a tube inside, oh, I already did. That's a problem. <laughs> but if you would have a tube inside, then you would feel more secure. Okay. So we also, people think that we don't do mini PCNL. It's not true. We also do 12 friends. We have done 12 friends PCNLs with a laser selectively on specific indications on a diverticulum that is very small, for example, and we couldn't go in with something else. You need to balance. A friend of ours, Pale Oster, says you need to adapt the anatomy of the patient to your scopes, not the scopes to the anatomy of the patient. And he's right. Initially, we were doing only big uh, 30 French dilations. Now we have found the indications for smaller diameters. And we're going to come out with a study with a nomogram that we are going to tell the people because it makes no sense if the system is small to go with a big scope inside, you are tearing everything. It's not the puncture itself that bleeds. It's the violation of your system. So if, if a small system with a small pelvis, you go in with a 30 French scope, you destroy everything. Okay. Uh, so Tariq, do you have any uh, more questions or any comments? Uh, not from my side. No, thank you very much. Okay. So there is uh, one asking, uh, Dr. Latsikas, uh, does the previous surgery uh, play a role in uh, choosing a papillary versus non-papillary or it's the same? No. Not at all. Not at all. And here I saw a nice uh, comment. Kirill uh, uh, wrote that uh, I guess Dr. Latsikas means uh, giving you an idea. If non papillary approach seems to be more convenient to remove the stone, you should not refrain to do it. It is something that you need to see and do to believe. Okay. I'm not saying it's not a rule. It doesn't mean that you should go non papillary all the time, you know? But if you do and you see how it goes, and it, it's, the, for me, the biggest, the safest way of doing PCNL if you put the wire down the ureter. And you know this wisdom. Exactly. Okay? And, you know, this is what makes the difference for me. Putting that wire down the different, down the ureter. And if you, if you puncture the lower calyx 
to get access to that lower pole with an 18, 18 gauze needle and you puncture it 10 times, you get bleeding only by the puncture. Exactly. Um, uh, and it's interesting now to see another group, uh, as Dr. Tarek mentioned, there's a group from Italy, published, they published their series of 260 patients doing non-papillary puncture. And uh, they, yeah, and they had the same results that uh, no complications mm -hmm. is different between the papillary and non-papillary. When I travel abroad and I do non-papillary punctures in hospitals, I do them in two types of centers. In one type of center, there has been someone that comes to my department so they know what I'm doing, so they're not afraid. In other places where I go that they've never seen me operate, they are so scared, they are prepared that, you know, it's going to be a bloodshed. Awesome. There. Yeah, it's going to be a massacre. I mean, and they are surprised at the end. You know, I, I was at Guy's Hospital two years, three years ago for a EAU live, and the guys there had five units of blood outside of the room. It's unbelievable. And when I finished in 10 minutes, in 10, because speed comes, comes with this procedure, speed comes with this procedure, they were shocked. Okay, almost disappointed because they didn't prove the point. So we need to be broad-minded in medicine. We cannot be narrow-minded. It cannot happen. As I told you, I gave you examples. Partial nephrectomies, biopsies on renal tumors. Uh, you know, we cannot be, you need to see it, do it, then criticize it clearly. But you cannot criticize something because it doesn't seem nice, especially when you don't have something else which is perfect to start with. Okay. okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Evangelist. Thank you very much, Dr. Tarek, for uh, 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 these very nice uh, presentations. Uh, Dr. Evangelist. Wisham, yes. just a comment. I see okay. one of the notes here by a colleague saying, I have done around 100 non papillary punctures and not any different com in complications. However, it's an, the alternative, not the rule. Why? <laughs> why? why? I just, you know, this is a big why. If I would have seen a comment saying I have done 100, but you know 10 or 15 were bleeding, then I understand this guy is critical. But why should someone do 100, get good results, no difference in what he was doing before, probably he did it because it was easier for him to do it, and then why does he still believe that this is a dogma that he cannot uh, have as a rule? This is, uh, you know, for me, it doesn't make, this yeah. is the question mark that we need to have in our heads. I didn't want to put my thoughts in here because I'm biased. I do non-popular puncture sometimes, but I think uh, a major point is that the simplicity of the uh, of the procedure. You don't want to, the procedure to be complicated, to uh, even to explain to the residents or your fellows that you have to go through the papilla. Uh, it's it makes it more complicated and it trains a lot of urologists to do PCNLs. Uh, um, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Evangelis. Thank you very much, Dr. Tarek. Uh, it's an honor to see you, Dr. Evangelis, as always. I know that uh, you want to leave us uh, now. <laughs> thank you for staying. I have with to us. leave you because otherwise they will kill me at home. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, <laughs> Dr. Tarek. Thank you, thank very, you much. very much. It's, been, a, it's been an honor. It's been an honor. Goodbye, guys. Okay, thank you. Bye. Uh, Dr. Adel Amari will carry on, uh, please. Yeah. One more comment before we move on. I. I agree with both of you. I mean, uh, the bleeding is coming from somewhere. If you're doing papillary or non-papillary, it's coming from somewhere. And I do agree. I think careful puncture, careful uh, uh, handling of an instrument, uh, torquing the kidney should be avoided. All of this is the key in whatever puncture you are using. So if you're using papillary or non-papillary, I think it's about how do you manipulate and how do you handle uh, the kidney and, and the scope. Okay, so we're moving to the next session. The next mm -hmm. session is the management of 1.5 uh, centimeter to 3 centimeter renal stones. Uh, the speakers will be Dr. Anders, uh, Dr. Andras, and Dr. Baghdadi, and Dr. Uh, Pangalati. 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 Ah, sorry, for, uh, it's, it's <laughs> from Greece. And uh, we're, so uh, Dr. Andras will, uh, will start. Okay, so first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. Do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you clearly. Okay, so now I have to share my screen. Exactly. Um, um, it has been uh, deactivated by the organi organization. I cannot activate it. Please allow me to activate it. Okay, just a uh... Okay.
I have an error message which says that the technician doesn't allow me to activate my screen. Go ahead now. Okay. So. Okay. Yes, we can see your screen now. Okay, you can see the, the, the slides. Okay. Yes. So I have to, to speak about uh, mini perk uh, compared with um, with uh, um, flexible Euro telescopy and also standard perk. So of course, the main advantage of flexible Euro telescopy is that it gives access to all calyces for the upper calyx, the mid calyx, and also the lower calyx. But as you know, it's a little bit more tricky because um, um, it is a little bit more dangerous for the ureteroscope and it can be technically a little bit more difficult. The difference with the nephroscope, the nephroscope is a rigid instrument with limited maneuverability. It can be uh, time to time dangerous to puncture through the, the upper pole because there is more risk of bleeding and also adjacent organ injury. The mid -cole the mid pole is, um, is also a little bit uh, problematic because uh, the fragments can fall into the, the lower pole. And um, the lower pole is probably the easiest um, uh, site to puncture a kidney. Of course, we shouldn't oppose all these procedures uh, because they are complementary. And as you see, um, the retrograde intraenal surgery is easier in the upper pole and mid, mid, mid calyces, and um, the, the percutaneous approach is, is maybe more optimal in the lower. So we, time to time, we even combine all these procedures. So the flexible ureteroscopy revolutionized the surgery of stone disease, but PCNL also underwent modernization. Historically, we had only one position, which was the prone position. We used uh, only large nephroscopes and fragmentation was done with ultrasound or with the lithoplast. Uh, um, now the PCNL also underwent some modernizations. We have different positions. Uh, there is a trend to miniaturization and we have a variety of fragmentation methods, including the laser. I will skip this slide because um, this is not really the issue today, but uh, we'll concentrate on miniaturization. So what is the rationale of miniaturization? If you look at the, the complications, the main complications of PCNL, you can see that, that the bleeding uh, is uh, uh, approximately 7% of cases in this multi-center study. It is too much. Bleeding of 7%, it's incredibly high. And if you, there are many, many articles now which uh, um, bring evidence that uh, if you do a smaller access, then the bleeding will uh, dramatically reduce. As you can see, with a big, big um, amplats and the big uh, access, you have 12% of bleeding and only 1% if, um, if the access site is less than 18 French. In our series, we have approximately 0.5% uh, of transfusion rate. So every 200 patients must be transfused. So this is how we check at the end of the procedure, the absence of bleeding. We remove the amplitude under visual control and uh, we can decide to do a tubeless procedure if there is no bleeding at all and if we are sure that there are no residual fragments. And Mahesh Desai has shown that in mini perk there are much more possibility of, of uh, tubeless procedure than with the standard perk. So this, all this, um, all this uh, evidence shows that um, mini perk is less, uh, induces less morbidity than the standard perk. Um, we also have uh, now the laser, but uh, it is a little bit problematic in the mini perk because as opposed to flexible ureteroscopy, we have not done a lot of studies about the laser settings. And 
I made a, I sent out a questionnaire to all members of the EURIS. And as you can see, the answers of, of, the, of the participants to this questionnaire were very, very heterogeneous. And as you can see, uh, many people used very small energy levels. This is the joule, the energy, and this is the frequency. So these settings are good for RIRS, but some people use high power lasers and they use, for example, two joules and 25 hertz. So this is, a, this is different. So should we use a small fibers as in the flexible telescopy? The answer is no, because the small fibers tremble and uh, it is impossible to, to rise the, the energy level in the small uh, fibers. So in, in the laser settings, usually three parameters are, are mentioned, the energy in joule, the frequency and the pulse duration. But there is also a very, very important um, fourth parameter, which is not mentioned, and it is intensity. What means the intensity? This is the energy transmitted, the amount of energy transmitted through unit area. And this will determine the effect of the laser at the tip of the fiber. So this leads us to high power laser. As you can see, the surface of a fiber of 200 micrometer compared to a fiber of 550 micrometer is 5.33 times more. So in fact, what, what, what happens is that if you use, for example, 0 0.3 joule with a 200 micrometer fiber, then you have to rise the energy to 1.6 joule in order to have the same uh, amount of, uh, of um, intensity uh, at the tip of the fiber. Some people um, have compared the efficacy of ultrasound during uh, standard PCNL uh, versus high power laser. And yes, the ultrasound is a little bit better and the difference is significant statistically, but the difference is only 14% of operative time. So this is not clinically really relevant. And in mini perk, we also have the vacuum cleaner effect, which allows to, to, to bring out the, all the stone fragments. So what about uh, flexible telescopy? As you know, for such stones of 1.5 centimeter to three centimeter, at the end of the day, we can obtain the stone free rate of approximately 80 to 90%. But there is a black box. What is, what is uh, happening um, before we reach this high stone free rate? And how can we uh, compare the two uh, procedures. So there, there can be different in number of sessions. We have also to, to observe the cumulative operative room time, the complications which are access related or infectious, the quality of life of the patients, which is related to the type and duration of drainage, and also the total treatment period and uh, the cost, finally the cost. So how to choose between uh, flexible urethroscopy and uh, percutaneous surgery, the preference of the patients, the disponibility of the material and the expertise of the surgeon. Of course, if you have no nephroscope, you will not do a percutaneous procedure. Um, the problem is with, uh, with flexible urethroscopy is that these are very, very fragile instruments and, uh, and have a limited uh, life duration and it is even worse if you use a sterile uh, disinfection method, which divides the durability of the instruments by two. The expertise of the surgeon, as you know, the learning curve of, uh, of the PCNL is uh, 100 cases. For the young urologist, it can be difficult to have 100 patients um, in order to have a sufficient experience. The choice of the patients, of course, well, I don't think that the patient chooses because it depends on what you tell to the patient. And if you tell him that you have a non-invasive method and you have another method, which is a little bit more invasive, this is sure that the patient will use the flexible urethroscopy. Now let us compare the efficacy and the morbidity of-, of Dr. Andres, one minute, please, okay? Yes. Sorry? One minute, please, one minute remaining for your talk. Oh, okay. So about the fragmentation, so I will not speak about the, the morbidity, the fragmentation, some people tried to determine the threshold 
of um, of the optimal size of the stones and it has been shown that for flexible ureteroscopy the optimal size is 19 millimeters and for the mini perk the optimal size is 35 millimeters so uh, there there is uh, the largest um, meta analysis was uh, with 1300 patients and um, this meta analysis shows that the stone free rate is better with mini perk again this is stone free in different locations um, this is the operative time again it favors mini perk the um, hospital stay favors rirs but personally i don't care with the hospital stay and the bloodless favors of course uh, rirs but uh, i mean uh, bloodless is something reversible so if I do not have time, when we, we can stop here and I'm ready to discuss uh, with. Uh... Okay, Dr. Andres, we'll leave the discussion. It's a very nice presentation. Thank you for it. We'll leave the discussion for the end of the session. We'll have yes. uh, Dr. Mohamed Baghdadi speaking about uh, RIRS and uh, Dr. Panayot is speaking about the standard PCNL. Uh, Dr. Adel, you want to carry on? Yes, Dr. Mohamed, could you go on, please? We'll, uh, while we're waiting, uh, we just want to launch a poll here for one minute. For everybody, please. So the question is for 1.8 centimeter, centimeter rear and stone, what would be the first choice for treatment? All right. So we'll end the poll here. And the results, more than 55% would choose uh, flexible retroscopy for a 1.8 centimeter renal stone. Uh, and 34% uh, for the mini PCNL and 11% only for a standard PCNL. So now Dr. Mohamed Baghdadi. Yes. Thank you for the invitation. Do you hear me? Yes, we can hear it clearly. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. For the uh, sake of time, just I will start uh, my uh, <clears throat> my presentations. Uh, my it's not working. I don't know why. Same problem. Yeah, uh, actually, my mentor they taught me one uh, valid point that uh, if you def want to defend your uh, position, you have to you have to attack your oppositions. That's why I'm going to start with a mini peg. Why is mini peg? Because this is the uh, uh, rule models that the new models in the market, which are proposed by Perk Holic uh, to be patent with the flexible retroscopy. And by default, I'm defeating the uh, mini pegs. Uh, I'm generally I'm defeating the PCNL. I'm taking just a, a few for what PCNL mini peg use is the technique used in the pediatric, and some inventor go uh, to develop this uh, axis and decrease this uh, scope size. Uh, to uh, make uh, less uh, complications, but like, unfortunately, the targeting, the, the, the marketing target, a confusing terminology used as the supers, as the perfect, as the small, as the ex-large t-shirt. Uh, the rational and the hypothesis behind the uh, mini perk uh, is uh, convincing, but at the same time, there is no automatism that the procedure with the, with the small size uh, causes uh, less uh, complications. And now the war happening between the PCNL holic, uh, holic they, themselves, the mini PCNL try to replace the standard PCNL in few times, uh, in few um, in few articles. So my point that the mini P, mini perk used in few indications like children's and difficult anatomy, and um, um, in that particularly. So the question raised on the roof here: this, Is the standard patient benefit from miniaturized PCNL? No, with the lack, uh, lack of data and uh, the low quality and poor quality of a meta-analysis with all of my respect, uh, with a lot of heterogeneity group that I wouldn't recommend to shift 
uh, either standard PCNL or the flexible retroscopy. So why this work happened uh, in the innovation between the two sides, between the PCNL innovations and innovation of retroscopy, the PCNL holic, uh, they crossed the borders and they tried to um, take a part from the uh, flexible retroscopy part. The war having, when war having, we have to retain back to our like uh, court or judge. Uh, let's take a few for the guidelines in the last decade. Uh, they dramatically changed from 2010 to 2019 for the European guideline. At that time, when they arrived, they arrived the new players with which uh, flexible retroscopy. Uh, see the guideline, the ceiling, the guideline between the uh, European and the American guideline. There is a the, despite they have the same root of the information and the article, but they have like a variation in classifications and looking to the angles. Like in the European, they divide to three categories of the volume of the stone, and that's why now the practice of the uh, midi pit now uh, a lot in uh, in, uh, in Europe more than in the United States. Even in the location, the European they have like the concentrating on anatomy, while in the American they still concentrating on the diameter of the stone. So before 2000 and arrival of the uh, flexible retroscopy, we have a two-way, either Israel or PCNL stone less than two centimeters, go with the uh, extra proportion wave life trypsy and more than two centimeters of PCNL. With the new competitors in the market, uh, most of the people, they, practice, they, they perform the stone uh, with the flexible retroscopy, despite, uh, especially when there is a revolution and evolution in the accessory of the flexible retroscopy. I would go, we all would, um, the PM, always we respect the borders and the, the boundary with other, uh, that more than two centimeter according to the uh, guideline is to a piece in L, but when in the few circumstances we could perform the flexible retroscopy when there is, was a contraindications, and as usual, the, uh, of the flexible retroscopy is performed for all body shape, either horseshoe, either pregnancy, is the rectopic kidney, we don't have a limitation on few uh, uh, complications. So this study, when we do, when we perform the, for few indications, uh, being successfully, and we found the norm for the stone more, larger than two centimeter to treat with the flexible retroscope, especially with innovation and the uh, revolution in the, uh, in the accessories. Uh, would the study support us, which lacking for a mini pair, which lack for mini pair. And this study is the decade ago. Uh, I think this is this study shows that I'm not going to because uh, <clears throat> I discussed before. This study showed there's uh, an extraordinary free rate with the flexible retroscopy. And this all of this study uh, has been done a decade ago with the revolution and new players in the accessory of the flexible retroscopy, like Tulian fiber with the uh, uh, extra uh, or tendinous and a beautiful result that you show this is the Tulian fiber laser. It's fragmented the stone uh, one centimeter in a few minutes with the, also the, another arrival of the Holmium Yaz laser and uh, Moses technology. All of these uh, accessories is going to facilitate and to demolish the mini pair. Uh, before we are afraid and we have like obstacle to train the resident uh, because uh, we're afraid to mistreat the uh, reusable uh, uh, flexible retroscopy. With our rival for a lot in the now in the market with a lot of the flexible retroscopy like Boston Scientific, OTU, Busing, a lot and a lot. And this uh, competition dragged the cost effective uh, down. And now the learning curve is becoming more and more. This is one of the data and low quality data with all of my respect, it's complications. They equalize the complication of PCNL with the flexible retroscopy and Israel. Despite the complication of the flexible uh, with the uh, mini pair despite its mini, um, minimal invasive or small uh, size, but it's painful. It's having one in your life, it's make it uh, miserable. It's very serious complication. Uh, it's, very, it's, it's very dramatic complications. It's not at all compar uh, comparable to the uh, complication of flexible retroscopy. Uh, again, this is the comparison with the, uh, all this is data compared the flexible retroscopy with mini pack, which I, I totally disagree. Uh, especially the stone free rate now high with the high watt uh, lasers. And even the learning curve for the flexible retroscopy nowadays is very easy and you can do it in even in periphery and it's not heavy center or no high volume centers. Core morbidity in the patient, flexible retroscopy, as I said, it is the ready for all, it is made for all of the body shapes in any uh, anatomical shapes. 
So this is one of the, my colleague, he, 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 he sent me this picture. He said, I perform uh, flexible vitroscopy. And then I, if it's hard, I, I convert it to the mini pair. So, and he, they wrote in the, the pair colic, a pair holic, uh, they, they wrote and about the cost effective, which I, just, I, I totally disagree. He wasted a few thousand in the floor. Uh, my take home message, just a great complication may occur even with a micro axis. Micro axis don't legitimize the micro axis. It's still the most complication happen when the axis sheet produced. Bleeding, a lot of complication happen. Size may matter, but what matter more, the right indication and the skill surgeon. Please stop crying about the bust and worrying about today. Treat your uh, per colic addiction and start smiling to future with the flexible retroscopy. Thank you. Uh, thank, you thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mohammed Baghdadi. Um, um, uh, for the sake of time, uh, uh, we'll leave the discussion uh, uh, toward the end. So uh, we'll move on uh, to uh, Dr. Paniati. Paniati is kind of Caledonis, my friend from University of Patra. Good evening. Uh, Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear it clearly. Can you share the screen, please? You have Thank a tough job, though. You have a, you have really a tough job. To <laughs> <you>. <laughs> uh, but before, before you start, we'll just uh, do another poll here uh, for everybody to answer, please, for one minute or less than that. So, a symptomatic 1.2 centimeter stone in a calcial diverticulum. What will you choose? It seems it that the percutaneous approach stone. winning the, the yeah, poll. The mini, perk, the mini perk is leading until now. Yeah, but it's 58% yeah, totally percutaneous. Mm -hmm. So I'll end the poll here and check for the results. So the mini perk and the 50%. They will choose mini perk for uh, treating uh, symptomatic 1.2 stone in a calcial diverticulum. And 43% Although... will choose <laughs> a flexible electroscopy, and only 7% will choose the standard PCNL. Oh. So good luck, Paniati. Good luck. Yes, although I'm supporting the standard PCNL, <laughs> okay. uh, I would say that for the poll, I would go also for the mini. <laughs> okay. Anyway, I'm going to share the screen and hope to. Uh... Yeah, we can see your screen here. Yep. Okay. Sorry. Here, you, uh, do you see it now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we can see it. Yeah. Okay. Great. Great. So I'm going to support uh, the standard PCNL. Uh, I suppose that uh, standard PCNL is something that is uh, for a lot of people is considered to be uh, not so modern, and it seems to be something that probably belongs to the past. But I would say that. Uh, everything has to do with uh, the proper indications and um, in the discussion that we're going to have you will see that there is still a lot of uh, place for uh, standard uh, uh, PCNL. First of all, the first uh, convention we have to do together and I think everybody agrees is that practically uh, not, stones and, uh, not all stones are the same. It's uh, we treat stone burdens. We, steep, we treat stone volume. 1.5 centimeter stone by 1.5 centimeter is a different stone burden than 1.5 centimeter by 0 0.5 centimeter. So when we consider that in our discussion, practically more or less, we know that um, uh, it's uh, uh, of the range of the stones that we're debating now, is a very big range of stones and stone burdens, to say it more correctly. We know that PCNL is the gold standard for large renal stones for many years now, and it's in the guidelines and it still is. Uh, for stone more than two centimeters, it's the gold standard. And the standard PCNL has been the standard for many, many years now. It works. It doesn't matter if it's mini or not, but it's very, very important to consider that it's a procedure that is still works very efficiently. Uh, 
for some reason, my PowerPoint doesn't work. Mm. So over the last few years, it's more than a decade, we have uh, modern technology, we have new instruments, we have uh, mini, ultra mini micro PCNL, but I would say that I'm really confused. Although I also do mini, I'm confused about the different approaches and what we consider mini. When we refer to mini, to a study of mini, we have to explain what is the size, what kind of procedure was really done. And this is so confusing that even in the guidelines, the only procedure that's been well defined is the standard PCNL. It's 24 to 30, to 30 friends. That's it. All the others, we do not know exactly what we're talking about. And in fact, even the studies that we have about mini PCNL, the stone burdens, the stone sizes that are being treated are similar to those of reels. So more or less, I was expecting what I just saw uh, from uh, my friends and colleagues uh, that there was going to be a debate about rears and mini PCNL. And uh, if I consider this as uh, uh, Sun Tzu was saying, the true master wins without even giving a fight. And more or less, I'm not giving a fight in this case. So mini PCNL, can, uh, the uh, stone bars that being treated are similar to rears. And even in, even in the randomized trials, the stones that have been randomized are smaller stones. So the advantages of standard PCNL are not so well shown. And even the definition of stone free rate, the stone free patient is the patient that has more than four millimeters stones present in the real collecting system. It's the same for me in PCNL, it's the same for years. But for the standard PCNLs, the stone free patient is only the patient that is completely stone free. You don't see any stone. That's a, that's a big difference if you consider how the procedure and what is about uh, what is important for the patient. Just consider a pilot, for example. Okay, I can understand that blood loss could be higher for standard PCNL, but even in bigger studies uh, with uh, many uh, thousands of uh, uh, patients, the transfusion rate is not that high. And we must consider also that the stones that are being treated with standard PCNL are usually bigger in size. So this is this different could be blended if we go for the similar uh, stones. The operative time clearly is a lot higher for uh, the mini PCNL. We know in most of the studies of mini PCNL that takes longer. And when something when a procedure takes longer, in the case of mini PCNL, it means that practically we will have in a bigger risk for complications, not for bleeding, only for bleeding, but also for other complications like fever, for example. So more or less, we we'll have an increase in the, in the complications just by increasing the operating time. And why is that? Because we have abolished the major, the major advantages of standard PCNL, which are the low pressure system, the excellent irrigation, low visibility, and the advantage of the ultrasonic lithotreter with a suction, and the use also of graspers, which are, can be very useful to get big st some smaller stones that can fit through the sheath or stone fragments. Less trauma to the kidney. We are not sure. Practically, none, none of the studies have shown that there was a difference in the trauma in the kidney between mini PCNL and standard PCNL. Less postoperative pain. I'm not sure because practically, if you leave a tube, you will have, uh, or even if you do tubeless, uh, you will have similar postoperative pain between the mini and the 30 friends. In a meta-analysis, in a very good meta-analysis that was a few years back, stone-free rates were the highest for standard PCNL and complication rates between standard PCNL and mini PCNL were similar. And this remains uh, for up to now. And for rears, rears had less complications, but the, the, but the uh, stone-free rates could not be uh, directly compared to standard PCNL. And as we are discussing about rears, a major disadvantage of rears is the lower pole stones. And here we know that there is a big advantage either for standard of, or mini PCNL for these smaller stones that they are below two centimeters. And we know also that even the results that we have for rears in lower pole stones, they are from studies that the patients were selected to, to have favorable anatomy in order for rears to be done. 
for larger stones, more than two centimeters, reels does not have the same stone free rate and uh, the operating time is a lot longer in comparison to PCNL. And of course, there would be people, as already stated, that they would say that uh, the high power laser could be a very good solution for doing a faster procedure and more efficient procedure. I agree, but do we really know how to use it? Because these are data that have been already submitted from one of our in vivo studies and we show how with the different operative setups, we can have a very different uh, thermal effect to the kidney. So considering this, do we know how to use it properly to use the extra power of this laser? We have to be extra careful. And of course, to have, in order to have, you have the laser, you have the high power laser, but what is the ablation rate? This is other data that are also going to be submitted very soon and these data show that you need quite a lot of time in order to treat big stoke burnings. Especially, uh, to, to tell it better, I would say that even for one centimeter stone could take quite long to laser the stone and make the, and make the patient stone free at least with the definition that we consider. Of course, we have also to consider the intralinear pressures, which are higher in the case of mini PCNL, and of course, in ureteroscopy, and all this could be related to septic complications. And we know that, and there are studies, clinical studies proving that, that the higher intralinear pressure could be considered a significant issue. So what does it propose in this case? I would say that I will not do standard PCNL in all cases. The images that you see that they are from cases done uh, I did last week. Big stone burden, good space, good anatomy of the kidney, I go with the 30, I clear fast and uh, with a very efficient manner, a big stone. If I have a narrow system, I respect the anatomy. I go with mini and I do a nice procedure. Uh, and at the same time, I respect more the anatomy that I see. If I have multiple stones, I have to do multiple accesses. I do a, a standard where I feel that there's a lot of stone burden. I do mini to reduce the trauma if possible in another point of the kidney. And this way you can treat, I think we have to tailor the approach. It's not meaning for every procedure. It's not risk for every procedure. It's not standard for every procedure, for every case. We have to uh, tailor uh, with all the instruments that we have our approach to treat better the patients. These were my thoughts about all this. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Paniotti. Uh, it's a, a very nice presentation and a very nice view of the Rio Bridge, which I love. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so now we'll start our discussion. Uh, I'll start by you, Paniotti. If uh, um, you do both, you do the standard PCNL and you started also doing a mini period. Uh, does the type of the stone play a role, not the size only, that you know, if you are suspected that th this patient has an affected stone? Does it change uh, your way of uh, tackling that stone, uh, choosing mini perk or standard uh, perk? I would say that uh, if I know that uh, the patient has a, a good obstructing stone and I have uh, an anatomy that is uh, that is appropriate for 30 friends, because the idea here is that um, if you have a very narrow pelvis, for example, or very narrow infundibula, you try to avoid traumatizing the kidney. So uh, even if the patient had uh, a, a, a stone that was related to infections and was problematic, I would go either to the two approaches based on the anatomy of the kidney, not based on if I do mini, I think that I will raise the intralinear pressures. But I have to explain this, that when I, I do mini, my access is 20 to 22 friends, and I use an 18 friends scope from Storch, through which you can insert uh, the ultrasonic litho treater with a smaller probe, 9.9 friends. So at the same time, I have more or less, I have a low pressure system, and I have the same time the suction to suck out even pass that I will find in the way and be very efficient and fast to treat the stone. I have to be fast in such a case. Uh, okay, but... Uh... 
But uh, Pariyati, uh, Pariyati, I know that uh, recently you have you have the um, uh, the Moses system uh, mm-hmm. from Lebanese. Do you use it? Do you utilize it in uh, the mini pair? Of course, you... of course, in uh, 12 friends mini okay. signals. We have the MIPS from Storch, uh, 12 friends axis, and this is the the uh, this is where we use uh, the Lumenis. Uh, 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 to treat uh, percutaneous liver stones. Otherwise, it's mostly for ears. Okay. Uh, Dr. Andres, uh, my next question for you, if you can unmute yourself, please. Yes. Okay, okay Dr. Andres, uh, I have a couple of questions for you. Uh, first of all, you're a member of the EOLS uh, and uh, the European Board of uh, Lithiasis. Uh, why do you think that uh, the mini perk didn't get, didn't, did not gain popularity? In the guidelines, uh, still and up uh, until now, there is no clear indication for when to use the mini perk. Well, I, I think that the, in fact, the mini perk is more and more popular. Mm-hmm. As the industry, as they are selling a lot of, uh, lot of devices, and even uh, in Greece, I, I, I had a lot of debate with, uh, with uh, Professor Liasikos and. Uh, I'm I'm um, quite I, I wouldn't say surprised, but uh, I'm happy that now you use more and more mini perk too. So I, I totally agree that uh, that uh, the instruments should adapt to to the patient, and not we have not to to adapt the patient to the instruments we have. So I also have uh, the standard perk, and uh, we spoke about the infectious stones, and uh, I think it's important to. To, for some kind of stones, it's important to have suction. This yeah. is not the question of of, uh, uh, of uh, track size, but but uh, the ability to have suction. Now you can also have suction with the mini perk because you have the so-called clear petra uh, device, which uh, can uh, aspirate the the irrigation fluid. But I would like to react uh, uh, concerning the this question of of pressure, intrainer pressure. Because uh, some people tell, I, I don't know whether I can show you some slides. Is yes, of course. Show? How can I make it to share the screen? <clears throat> okay. Uh, I don't see this. You do, do you see this? Yeah, one? I can see your screen, yeah. Yes, okay. So <clears throat> this is in fact the equation which describes the, the pressure Uh, relationship in in uh, all endourological procedures. So you have the flow. This is the pressure gradient. This is the viscosity, which is always identical because we use saline solution. This is the length of the tunnel, and here you have the two radius. Now, if you look at this um, is this uh, curve, you can see that the the radius the, the radius of the endoscope has to be very very near. To the radius of the channel before the pressure rises, and many people are worried about hyperpressure in mini perk. And my answer is that they should mainly worry about hyperpressure in in flexible ureteroscopy, because uh, this is the Pala Oster study which shows that the intraina pressure rises up to 400 centimeter water in some kinds of um, of um, of uh, retrograde interinal surgery procedures. And uh, th- let me show the last uh, slide. And this is the work of uh, Udo Nagele, who shows that the, in mini perk, we are always, always under the threshold of pyrovenous uh, uh, backflow. And even if in the case of, um, even in the case of retrograde interinal surgery, we have not so many, many um, septic complications. We have high pressures in the kidney, but not, not many, many septic complications. So I don't know how to stop my... my uh... Uh, Dr. Andres, which size yeah. of, uh, of uh, mini perk do you use, the sheath and the nephroscope size? Well, I, I have several. I have the 18 French. This is 16.5 internal diameter. We have also the ultra mini perk, which uh, was... Uh, made by Janak Desai, and uh, we also have the micro perk. So we, we have, um, uh, I would say, almost virtually all of them. Yeah, uh, 
you know, uh, we were taught that, uh, you know, you have to always respect the four French uh, uh, the difference between uh, the nephroscope yeah. This, and the shape. Well, sorry, this is expert opinion. There is no any scientific evidence for that. This uh, so is you, you, you don't think it matters? Really, you have to be very, very near to, mm -hmm. the, to the size of the, of the channel in order to have an increased pressure. And think about a rigid ureteroscopy. There is no backflow. So what happens with the fluid? Imagine you are injecting fluid and there is no access sheet, nothing. And if you use a big ureteroscope, then the, the, the irrigation fluid cannot come, come back. So we, I think that with the retrograde surgery, I mean, rigid ureteroscopy or flexible ureteroscopy, especially without access sheet, we have very, very high intrainer pressures and nobody worries about this. And everybody tells mini perk leads to high intrainer pressure. So stop it a little bit. I think that there is no hyperpressure in mini perk. And there is no more uh, septic complications in mini perk than in standard perk. Okay, okay. With, the, with this a new uh, technology uh, regarding the thorium fib fiber laser and the uh, trilogy, do you think it's moving uh, away from PCNL? Or is it actually moving towards the mini PCNL? Is it moving I, away I, from? I, as far as I know, it is not really recommended for, for the PCNL, the thorium laser. It is mainly recommended. I had the opportunity to, to visit uh, Dr. Gadjiev in, um, in St. Petersburg in Russia. And um, he told us that he doesn't use it all uh, for, the, for the percutaneous procedures. So I think we, we will stay with the uh, with the whole me laser probably for mini perk and for for perk, and uh, probably switch to to tulim laser um, in in the coming weeks. Um, we we will get also the device, so I hope that we we can switch to tulim laser in the flexible retroscopy. So we had another poll here uh, for a 2.8 centimeter stone renal pelvis and the hand field of 1,300 unit in a male patient with a body mass index of 31. Your choice would be staged uh, urotroscopy or one session urotroscopy or a mini perk or a standard PCNL. You know, so, honestly, no, a mini perk, I would do a mini perk. Which is the stone size? The 2.8 no, with a hand field of 1,300. In fact, you know, we are speaking about operative time, but uh, what takes a lot of time is patient positioning than the puncture and dilatation and uh, the fragmentation time is, is only a part of, of, of uh, the procedure. So it is not so slow. Believe me, in, with high power laser, the, the procedure goes quite rapidly. With a, with a 2.8 uh, centimeter stone, it's not, not a problem. And the... Sorry? You know, I, uh, now, I think what, what's happening is, is a bit confusing the people now. We, they started with mini PCNL, which is like 21 French, and then they moved quickly to ultra mini, uh, 15, and then they moved to the micro PCNL. Now we are confused because the data keep coming very quickly. I mean, it's not like the standard PCNL where that was studied for years. It's the same size of uh, uh, the sheet, and we can study the results. But as they said, even in their presentation, that still it's confusing What's this, the mini PCNL? What is the ultra mini? What's the micro PCNL? I think the data is still not uh, solid in one uh, size. So there is a lot of data coming out of 21 French. And then very quickly, another data is coming about the 16. And now more data is coming out the ultra mini or the micro. So I think this is one of the things that confuse people of moving toward the mini PCNL. What do you I totally think? agree. So, so, and and in fact, our fragmentation protocols with the laser are also very, very uh, heterogeneous. When you ask people, when you see the biggest uh, uh, experts in mini perk and the the oldest one, uh, they they use time to time laser settings like uh, for flexible ureteroscopy. So, this is very very difficult to compare. But on the other hand, uh, the, the miniaturization becomes more and more popular. Right, great. I have, do, we uh, have do we have any? Yes, go ahead. Uh, do we agree that in that stone, 1,300 yeah. household units, 2.8 centimeter, that it has to be done in a percutaneous approach? Well, do you we know, I, 
Personally, I, I, I follow the recommendations of the AAO. And um, if you take such a stone with the flexible ureteroscopy, you cannot be sure that you will treat the patient in one session. And this is problematic because as I told, I don't care about hospital stay. If a patient stays one or two days, it's not a big deal for me. The problem for me is that the same patient has to go twice in the operative room or three times. And it is impossible because we have so many patients that we cannot afford to uh, put the same patient three two times in, in the OR. And for a, for a 2.8 uh, uh, centimeter stone, all the studies show that there is approximately a 30% uh, retreatment rate. Okay, so Doctor, is, Doctor Andres, uh, for the, for the settings in the department, some uh, a lot of the hospitals uh, don't have the high power laser. They have the twenty watt laser or the thirty watt laser. Do you, do you think that plays a role in uh, in um, you know uh, deciding uh, whether to go with the mini perk or not? 30, 30 watt is fine. I I I made a lot of procedures out of my department. And uh, we set the laser to 2.5 joules and 12 hertz, and then you obtain 30, 30 watts, and it is fine. It is quite fast. But I don't agree with people who use, for example, 0 0.8 uh, joule and uh, 15 hertz. I, I do not agree with this point of view. Uh, Dr. Mohamed Baghdad is with us. If you can answer a question. Dr. Baghdadi. Do I? Yes, easier. Yeah. Okay. Dr. Baghdadi, what about the cost effectiveness of the flexible electroscopy? Uh, you know, uh, flexible electroscopy is not a cheap uh, device, uh, either what is a reusable or a disposable device. And you have a lot of, uh, you know, accessories to use along with the flexible electroscopy. Uh, do you think it's logical to, to favor a flexible electroscopy over mini perk? Yes, uh, uh, you have to, we have advantage and disadvantage for, for each uh, procedure. Actually, with the new competitors or the new uh, disposable flexible retroscopy, first of all, the, the, the price coming down. Uh, first, um, also, I will go with the surgical preference and the skills. Uh, for flexible retroscopy, it's the, the skills is not that matters like a, a piece in nail. Uh, for me, I would go with a more uh, less invasive. Uh, even and availability and availability in your center. If you are, if if your center everything settled and set up, I would go with the flexible retroscopy since there is a lot of now competitors that bring the price down. And less invasive. This is the most important. I will go with the procedure which less invasive and more uh, com uh, comparable to the other invasive procedure. Some of the study that showed that the free rate in in the stage stone is ninety five to ninety seven which I would, I would advise the patient to tolerate the discomfort from the restage or the hospital stay, better to go with the, a more invasive procedure that has caused a lot of problems like trans, uh, blood transfusions and other, uh, or the, uh, um, some uh, injury like transfusions and colon injury or the, the, the rare complications. Can I, can I ask something? Yes, of course. How, how long? Will you consider that is too much to stop the case? How long, or how much time should you be operating to stop for the me, procedure? For me, I will stop for the second session. For second, for the first session, I would take not more than two hours. The second session, I will not take more than one and a half hours. Uh, what would make you change between two in the first session and one and a half in the other one? Why not to do again two hours? If I need, I will go. It depends on the, on the size of the stone in the second session. It depends on the hardness of the stone. It depends on a lot of things. But I'll try to finish maximum, as maximum I can in the first session, and then I'll go to the second session with more, uh, like, uh, more flexibles and more, um, <clears throat> like, take more time. How long would it take to do the 2.8 centimeter stone in our center? I'm not, I'm saying, uh, I mean. PCNL? PCNL. It would take uh, like like any center. We take we we'll, we talk it like one hour in our center to thirty minutes. It's it's a big difference because practically you have a patient that has but to undergo one are, twice. But still you are invasive, and it go once it go wrong. Sometimes it go wrong bad. 
So, Why not go wrong the two hours time in uh, not, doing reels? Yeah, two hours time going reels, according to the studies that are available, you have a very high risk to have septic complications in comparison to doing a procedure that is what less is than the most, one hour, what one is, hour, what is the most? Uh, what is the most like nightmare complication in a flexible retroscopy with sepsis, okay? Yes, you, can but we, you can predict the sepsis before the procedures. And you can cover all of the MDR and positive uh, organ with your antibiotic. But with but in BCNN, you cannot predict to what do the, to have yeah, septic but, complications. It's not yeah, but it, with go, bleeding, but not sepsis. But it's not minimizing, it's still invasive. It's not minimizing. And uh, with a lot of uh, accessories that come into the market. In order to work in order to work in uh, and do the, the rears. You have to practically for two hours, more or less, you have to pre to insert an, a ureteral axesith. The ureteral axesith has a stricture rate of two percent. But okay, you uh, cannot have... compare uh, ureteral axis with the pneumothorax or yeah. with the with the with the uh, colon injury, yeah. or sometimes you can go to the rectectomy. <laughs> yeah, but it's zero exactly. I would agree with Anders. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> because it, it's it's really uncommon to have all these kind of complications. We may present in different congresses a lot of different complications. And okay. what I want to, to 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 the discussion that we have is based on one very specific point: is that. When you choose to do a very big stone with doing reefs, probably you are not choosing exactly the correct approach to do it. But uh, as I, I said, it's before, it probably in the experience of every surgeon, this approach, doing reefs, because he's more experienced in doing that, I agree. Do what you know best. But the, uh, the endourologist should be able to, do, to provide different approaches. So with such a stone, I... I it's more the size of the stone is more to the side. I would say it's probably made this 1,300 house, uh, thousand uh, household units stone. And the size <laughs> is made for the percutaneous approach. This is what yeah. what I can uh, what I can say. This is the the okay, procedure. Uh, the the, the, the reason why this kind of approach are I, 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 like I said before. But I wouldn't go uh, more than two centimeters with the with the flexible retroscopy unless there is a contraindication for PCN. Uh, Baghdad and Paniotti, please. Uh, we I are, agree. Uh, for this, I totally agree. Paniotti, we're, we're launching now a, a, a new poll for a stone that is two centimeters in the lower calyx. What would you choose? A two centimeter in the lower calyx. Okay. For me, it's, uh, it's more likely that I would go mini perk with the, the way that they described. Okay. But but I don't know what the uh, after, after the mini perk, after the mini perk, what do you leave? After the mini perk is a double J. Double J. Depending on the gaze, a double J and, an, and a balloon nephrostomy. Okay, Dr. Andres, after the mini perk, what do you leave after the... I leave a uh, eight French pigtail um, nephrostomy and, uh, and uh, time to time, it depends. It can be a double J, but not always. Okay. So what, what I do is to, if I want the patient go home next day, then, then I, I leave a double J so you, he can go home next day. If, so, if the patient can stay two days, then I, I, I can leave a ureteric catheter and the, and the nephrostomy and first I remove the ureteric catheter and then I clamp the nephrostomy. And if the patient has no pain, then I remove the nephrostomy and the patient goes home without any tube. That's so, the problem of flexible retroscopy is also the, the, the presence of double J because it, uh, some patients really feel miserable um, when, when they have double J, they have a lot of pain and, uh, and the quality of life, which is much harder. So you can eliminate this with uh, the use of PERC. Yeah, so uh, the, you can see here the results of the poll. Interestingly, uh, more than the majority choose the standard PCNL for treating the for a lower calcium stone measuring two centimeter. Me personally, I would choose uh, the mini perk. Um, uh, you know, this is a very interesting debate. Although you know, many say that it might be ended or all the debate, but th you know, the debate that's going on here and the, the chat room shows that it's still going on. 
what we aimed from uh, you know uh, launching this debate or putting this debate together is not to show that the superiority of one device over the another or one treatment over the, over the another. So it's uh, basically a tar a targeting that to show the advances uh, and the pros and the cons of each treatment. You know, um, um, I think that there's a lot to consider uh, for choosing the treatment, the stone hardness, the uh, body mass index, the, uh, the experience of the surgeon, the instrument available, the setting of the department. Like Panayoti said, you, you know, the, uh, the PCNL and uh, the, the Department of Patra doesn't take a long time, but you know, uh, you have a different setting that you don't have it anywhere, anywhere else. You know, and, and, uh, not a lot, of the, a lot of departments can do nine PCNLs per day. You have a different setting, so you're working with your setting. So, uh, so uh, Dr. Adel, if you'd like to comment as well. Yeah. I think I think I agree with with all of you guys, but just one thing to remember that uh, there is nothing called safe procedure 100 percent. So no matter what you do, you do a mini PCNL, you do a standard PCNL, you do retroscopy, a papillary puncture, non papillary puncture, the choice of the patient, the choice of your instrument, your infrastructure, respect the tissue and respect the kidney. That I think will give you the results that you want. Just remember that. Yes, you can injure the colon in, uh, with the mini piscina, with the larger, uh, with the standard piscina, but still the urethroscopy, there is an evolution of the urethra, and there is a structure. So uh, still there is a risk of, of uh, any procedure. So I think choosing the proper procedure for the proper patient with your experience, with your infrastructure, will give you the exact result that you want. It's just the, make the patient stone free and at the same time, make sure that your uh, standard budget or the budget is met and you don't have that complication. Uh, yes, Dr. Wissam, I think uh, we're almost going to the end of uh, the yeah. meeting. Yeah, I, th I think that this debate can t take much longer. It's a very interesting yeah. debate. But and, and now we're staying at the one and a half hour. So uh, I think we can conclude our session with this uh, conclusion. Um, Dr. Adil? Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Tariq is, <clears throat> I don't know if he, I didn't hear his sound, but see he's uh, raising his hand. He's saying the risk of the uh, sepsis with the flexible arthroscopy is much more than the PCNL. This is his comment. <laughs> ah. <laughs> anyway, so uh, we're reaching to the end. Uh, I would like to thank the speakers. Uh, Dr. Still, you can predict the sepsis and you can treat it very well. You can predict the sepsis and you can treat your patient with covering with antibiotic. Still, it's a predictable. Yeah, but it's still, it's sepsis. Yeah, it's still, but it's predictable. It does, it's not just only for your retroscopy. It can happen with the PCNR, with mini I totally agree. Yeah. So I think this is, this, this we should respect the rules uh, of, of treating the patient. And guidelines. That we are following. Uh, uh, I would like to thank uh, all of you guys, the speakers, uh, the attendees, and uh, this uh, meeting uh, uh, happened because of the support of Saudi Urology Association and all the partners uh, in Greece and, and France. Uh, thank you very much. It's uh, recorded in the YouTube, and we'll send you the link later. Uh, <laughs> uh, you can watch it anytime. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the Thank you, Baghdadi, Dr. Tariq. Dr. Good night. Bye.